Today's reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, through chapter 4, verse 1. It's on page 175 in the New Testament. Although Paul's devotion to Christ has caused him to be persecuted, he does not regret the course he has taken. Writing from prison, he expresses confidence in a glorious future, and he encourages other Christians to follow in his footsteps. The reading begins at verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. He does this by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Holy Gospel. About the congregation to please be seated. So, this week I feel that I need to explain how in the world we choose the readings we do to focus on each week. Because today's gospel story as well as the other reading, just feel random, right? Or is it just me? So in case you ever wanted to know, long story short, we follow a schedule of predetermined biblical readings called a lectionary. We don't have to do that. We don't always do that. But when we do, we do so to emphasize unity. We, along with other Lutheran, Catholic, Methodist, and a whole host of other Christian denominations around the world who choose to follow this reading plan, hear the same story on the same weekend, and all together we reflect on how these stories move us and shape us to see ourselves, others, and the world through the eyes of Christ. And actually, that's pretty cool if you think about it. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing the same thing, the same ritual on the same weekend. So on the one hand, this unity is great symbolism for what it means to be church together. But on the other hand, the drawback to doing this is that often the selected stories are really short and they're yanked out of a much larger story which makes it hard to understand. I think about it like this. It's like opening up the third book in the Harry Potter series. And there's what, like eight books or something in the Harry Potter series? And you turn to page 147 and then read four sentences out of the second paragraph. 
and then ask those who are listening, did you enjoy the story? We're like, no, we have no idea what's going on. So quickly, here's what you need to know about today's seemingly random gospel reading to give it a little bit more context so you can understand what in the heck is going on. So Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. And on his way, he has been healing people on the margins of society who have lost their community, their livelihoods, and even their families due to their conditions. He has publicly and brutally criticized the institutional religious authorities for completely misrepresenting God and God's intentions for the world by making life actually harder and more unjust for people. He has been teaching, teaching anyone who will listen to him, challenging people's fixation on wealth, power, and assumptions we make about how the world should be. And here's the interesting thing. People are actually listening. More and more are being drawn to Jesus, especially those who do not have many opportunities in life or power. They are finding renewed life and wholeness by experiencing this love that Jesus has, this love of God through Jesus' way of living, and they are then being encouraged to replicate Jesus' teachings and actions in the communities that they are from and sent out to. People are noticing this movement. People are noticing its leader, especially those in power who see Jesus growing followers as a threat to their own power and political stability. And so in today's gospel, Jesus receives a warning. There are rumors that Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, wants him dead. Jesus is given then an opportunity to stop what he is saying, to stop what he is doing. He is given the chance to change his travel plans, to be in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, to walk away from his public teaching and to rein in his criticism of the religious authorities before it is too late, before something really, really bad happens to him. But he doesn't stop. He won't. He can't. Jesus' vision to bring about God's kingdom on earth as in heaven, it drives him forward. Like a mother hen protecting her offspring, the gospel writer says, he cannot let people go even to save himself. So this is where we are in the larger story. And what I find particularly challenging and at the same time life-giving in this very small section is how Luke talks about living in the midst of fear. And I think that is incredibly relevant because we all deal with this, or at least we all will at some point. One of the things that it means to be human is that we have to deal with fear in our lives. We can't avoid it. And moving forward in the midst of fear, it requires courage. But courage is one of these loaded words. I, I often am not 100% sure what people mean when they say it. So I'm curious what you think about this word. Let's do just a little bit of a word association. If I say the word courage, what is the first thing, the first image that pops into your head? Courage, lion, brave, strength. Anybody else? I didn't hear. Fireman, perfect. You did exactly what I wanted you to do. Well done. Because when we hear that word, we often conjure images of these brave individuals like firefighters or police officers or somebody in the armed services. Uh, we often associate this word with action. We think of people who act in a moment of crisis. They push fear aside 
and intentionally put themselves in harm's way. So again, like images of firefighters running into a bur burning building, right? That's what comes to mind. So in this image, courage then is embodied by strong, well-trained, better than average individuals. People who are generally referred to as heroes in our culture. And no doubt, that is a kind of courage, but it's not the kind of courage that most of us will have the opportunity to live into. And it's not the kind of courage, believe it or not, that's described in the biblical stories. Courage then can also be described as deciding to embrace a difficult path in the midst of uncertainty and fear for the sake of someone else. And what strikes me about this kind of courage is the central role that vulnerability plays. To anticipate challenge and suffering in life and not look away, not turn back, by definition, is to make oneself vulnerable for the sake of others. And I think this is really important to point out because as a culture, we do not tend to value vulnerability. We sure don't associate it with courage. So many see vulnerability as a sign of weakness, something that ultimately we want to avoid at all costs. And yet, in the biblical story, the way of Jesus confronts fear in the world with a courage that honestly can only be described as a vulnerable kind of courage, a vulnerable kind of love. So I know that might be a little bit abstract, a little bit heady. So let me describe it like this. In the past few months, Matt Metz, our developer for youth, family, and young adult ministries here at Bethlehem, has helped me think about this kind of vulnerable courage as he and his wife, Ashley, welcomed their first child into the world. The guy in the center there is Wallace, or Wally Metz. To become a parent is an act of courage, because to become a parent is to be held hostage to fate. There is no way that you or any of us can protect our children from the threats that this life presents. Life is inherently unpredictable. And as much as we want to control what happens to us and to others, we can't. And that not only leaves parents profoundly vulnerable, but it promises a level of suffering that you simply would not endure if you had not bound yourself to your child. And yet parents have the courage to face fears in this world willingly suffer, walk down roads that they do not want to walk down, to become vulnerable, all out of a profound sense of love for their children. The gospel writer gets at this idea by describing Jesus as a mother hen. Now, does that metaphor work for you? Just out of curiosity, are you from an agricultural background that goes, oh yeah, a mother hen, of course. Well, if you're like me and not from that background, that image might go over your head or, or just do nothing for you. So I took a little bit of time and I spent uh, time this week watching YouTube videos on mother hens. And just in case you're like me and have no idea how mother hens function in this world, here's a, here's a 30, Oops, here it comes. Here's a 30 second clip for you. So the thing that I notice is that it's amazing how this small animal will take on a creature 10 times its size, even give her life for the sake of her chicks. So let me give you another example to try and flesh this out some more. 
So I used to do a lot of running outside. Now it's more biking than running. But still, I love being outside. And years ago, I was running down a path, and ahead of me was a group, a large group, of geese and their babies. They were totally taking over the path. And, well, like they own the place. And it's like, that's not right. And my assumption was that they would see me coming, running down this path. I was not being quiet. They would have time to notice me and then move, get out of the way. So I kept running. That is not what happened. <laughs> Instead, as I got closer, one large goose lowered its neck about an inch off the ground, opened its beak, stuck out its tongue, and made a hiss sound that sounded like a demon from the pits of hell. <laughs> it then proceeded to charge me, and I had no choice but to turn around and run for my life. <laughs> Mother Goose was not going to let me near her babies. This mothering impulse that these animals have, that all mothers have, transcends time, culture, and as we saw in many cases, species. It is also, according to our gospel reading today, a divine impulse. When you see a mother doing her thing, when you see her heart breaking for her children, the lengths that she will go to to give life and her willingness to become vulnerable for the sake of those she loves, she is tapping into the very nature of who God is and what God is like. And that is a gift. That is grace. That is a vulnerable kind of courage. So again, why in the world does this matter? Because like I said before, we all live with fear. We may not want to talk about it. We might not, we, start over. We might want to deal with our fear by not dealing with it, by ignoring it, by pushing it way deep down inside of us. But eventually, what we fear, it will find us. It will land in our lap and confront us. And when that time happens, how in the world do we move forward? That is part of what it means to be human. I have seen fear paralyze people, shut them down as they withdraw from living the life that they had. I have seen fear make people angry, so angry as they lash out at others and the world. I have seen fear rob people of the kind of life that God dreams for creation as they turn in on themselves and crumble under the weight of anxiety and stress that fear brings. And the story of our faith does not make our fears vanish, nor does it inoculate us from ever having to deal with really hard things that are scary. Instead, the way of Jesus challenges the way that we respond to fear when it comes into our lives. Out of love, Jesus cannot stop healing people. He cannot walk away from restoring people's dignity and life. He cannot remain quiet to any person or institution who would perpetuate injustice in the world that God loves. And so even when he is warned, even when there is good reason to be afraid, this divine motherly love moves Jesus forward in the midst of fear. I think in our context, we can call this a ministry of presence. That's how we speak about this in the church. And it's something that takes courage, and it's something that any one of us can do. Anytime you show up and walk with another down a difficult path, to listen without judgment or unsolicited advice, anytime you bear witness to another's illness, suffering, anxieties, anytime you open yourself up 
in a vulnerable way out of love for another to let them know that they are not alone in this world and that they have somebody to walk with them as they are dealing with what they are dealing with, you are tapping into this divine love that Jesus spoke of and lived into himself. And while this vulnerable love does not make fear vanish, it does allow us to confront fear in a way that in the end leads to life and wholeness. I mean, this is one of the things that makes the church the church. It's not often found in other places. And so today, whatever fears that you carry with you, whatever fears that you have stuffed deep down inside and may not want to look at, may you come to find peace in the divine, motherly, vulnerable love that God has for all of God's creation and find the life that comes from sharing that love with others in your life. This is the good news we hear today. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.